What caused this former outlaw motorcycle gang member to see deaf ears healed, blind eyes open? Next on this edition of It's Supernatural. Centuries have come and gone, offering wisdom and understanding throughout the ages. Today, there should be nothing beyond one's power to discover. And yet, the strange, unusual, and mysterious world of the supernatural defies understanding. Stay tuned for a unique and powerful investigation into a curious, undiscovered universe only on It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. I'm here with Dick Rubin. Now, he doesn't look like one right now, but there was a time, Dick, when um, if I crossed you, what would have happened to me? Well, I was an enforcer in a major outlaw motorcycle gang on the east coast of America. And uh, we would break heads and sling chains and do all kinds of those uh, 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 situations or, or be in situations like that where people uh, would get did, hurt. Did, did you feel bad for the people when you were as an enforcer? Did you, uh, uh, did you have a heart for what you were doing? Did you realize what you were doing? I guess, Sid, I guess, you know, we call ourselves the one percenters and we're dropouts from society. You know, we're nonconformists, but we conform in our nonconformity. Of course. You know, we're not establishment, or at least that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, you couldn't trust anyone. We came up in the generation of the Vietnam era where, you know, you don't trust anybody over 30, et cetera, whatever. And so, you know, one guy watches your back and uh, you become friends. But you're, you're never close to anyone. You're kind of a loner, even though you're in the midst of other people that think like you. Well, were you into drugs or alcohol? Oh, sure. Drugs, prostitution, uh, manufacturing of drugs, uh, pornography, these kind of things. Everything that goes along with that environment. And, uh, you know, one day, March 1st, 1971, uh, I was totally set free. How? Tell me about that. Well, it, it began about two years before that, and a fellow named John Jimenez, who is uh, the pastor of a rock church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, John had been used to uh, form three Washington for Jesus, a very well-known man mm -hmm. who came out of the drug scene in uh, Spanish Harlem. He heard about me and for some reason came to the streets and told me about Jesus. And the thing he told me was, he didn't try to preach a message to me. He said, Jesus loved me just like I was. I said, he can't love me just like I am because I, I know, I mean, I know I'm wrong. I know uh, I, I'm not lovable. And uh, so he told me that Jesus loved me just like I was. And for two years, I heard that voice in my spirit. Jesus loved me just like I was. And Did so, you give him any satisfaction when he said that? Did you say, well, I'm a little bit interested? No, the satisfaction I gave him, I think, was a cursing as I sent him on his way because I had told people that I was going to annihilate this guy. I didn't like Puerto Ricans. I didn't like blacks. I didn't like anybody, including myself. And so uh, he even says to this day he feared me because I was over 300 pounds, the long hair, the bandana, the earrings, the whole thing, okay? And so uh, uh, he knew he couldn't reach me, I guess, with the gospel, but he just dropped that little thing in my spirit that Jesus loved me just like I was. And uh, for two years, I went through agony and misery because I kept hearing this voice in the middle of the night. I would wake up, Jesus loves you just like you are. And about a year before I, I came to faith in the Messiah, and uh, it, an interesting thing happened to me on the way home. When I was coming home one night, and uh, I lived in the drug world, but that night my head was pretty, pretty clear. And out of the back seat of this car that I'm driving, I hear this voice saying, I've called you to preach my word, son. <laughs> that must have been a shock. So, well, I thought I was tripping out. Mm -hmm. I went about another hundred yards or so down the road. I heard the voice again. I stopped the car, got out, looked in the back seat of the car. No one was there. And not long after that, March 1st, 1971, you know, I accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And uh, uh, so that's kind of how I came to know Jesus. It was through a, a fellow named Rex Humbard. And he had a television show. And I used to make fun of this guy. He was Mr. Clean, Mr. Establishment, you know. So I was going to go to harass him at that meeting that night. No one knew that I was going to that meeting. I went there, I sat up in the balcony as high as I could get into the balcony, as far away I could get from this religious fanatic, but he's Mr. Clean, and I'm just going to look at him, poke fun, do all mm -hmm. the things, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, the world wants to do to humi humiliate God's people. And uh, uh, there came time for the altar call. I listened to the message, and the message was about you can't run your life like you can't drive a car looking in the rearview mirror. You can't run your life doing the same thing looking behind. And it impacted me. Now I'm sitting there, he gives this altar call. I don't know what an altar call is from nothing, okay? 
And all of a sudden, I see these people running up to the front. I'm sitting as high in the balcony of the uh, an old uh, center theater there in Norfolk as I could get. And after everyone was up there, I'm sitting there and I'm shaking. I'm sweating profusely and my heart feels like it's pounding out of my chest. He reaches his finger up and says, you, up in the balcony. I don't know if he said that to me. There were others around me, but, right. it, uh, but I felt it personally. He reached up and his finger must have been 100 yards long. And he said, you. And it went right to the end of my nose. And I knew I had to make a decision. And in that violent world of the outlaw biker, you don't know when you're going to, to, to end things, when things are going to mm -hmm. wind up uh, uh, you know, bad for you. I mean, because you always have people that are wanting to kill you or to do harm to you, whatever. I knew then that if I didn't make Jesus Lord of my life, that I would not make it very much longer. All my friends that, that I rode with are either dead or in prison. Uh, and, and that's the only way you can get out of that environment. But I responded to the altar call. Now, this is, this is the phenomenal, the supernatural thing about this altar call. I was the last one. He said, sir, I see you moving. I'll wait for you. I had to walk all the way down. It took me maybe five minutes to get down to the lower platform. I walked up behind because the people had, had, had filled up the aisle. I walked as the last one in the aisle. I stood there. He said, pray a prayer. I prayed a simple prayer. When I did, a hand grabbed a hold of my hand. I'm standing there. I don't know anybody from nothing. A hand grabbed a hold of my hand. I looked down. It's my mama. And my mama had gotten saved five years before that in a Baptist meeting. And she said, son, welcome to the kingdom. She never knew where I would be. Out of all the thousands of people there that night, I stopped right beside her. And she said, son, look. And there was four or five older ladies there. She said, they've been interceding for you for the last five years to come to the kingdom. So she didn't even know you were she gonna be there. She, had, she had no idea I would be there, that I would be at, at a religious meeting. And I happened to be right where she could hear me pray that sinner's prayer and make Jesus Lord of my life. And she'd been well, saved well, five the, years prior. You know, to those older women that had been praying for those five years saw such a miracle. Guess what happened to his drugs, his alcohol, his women, his outlaw motorcycle gang? Instantly, instantly. I mean, that is a miracle. Be right back and find out how God is using him to pray for people and the greatest miracles are happening, lives being changed, people being healed of medically impossible situations. We'll be right back after this. Hello, YouTube, Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word, it means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe, then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter, here with Dick Rubin, and it's hard to believe, looking at him today, that this man was an enforcer for an outlaw motorcycle gang drugs, uh, alcohol, sex, the, the whole nine yards, especially the brutality, and instantly set free by a power greater than him. Now, Dick, something that really intrigues me has to do with the fact that you developed a great love, almost out of the blue, but reading the Bible, for the Jewish people, you're not Jewish, and for the nation Israel, and anything to do with, with Jewish people. I remember I knew you back then, and, and, and you, you had such this hunger, and one day you called your mother, and- Mother called me from Texas. And what did she say? I asked her, I said, Mama, is there any, any person that's in our family that's ever been Jewish or intermarriage or any kind of But why would you even ask that? I have no idea to this day, Sid. I mean, I do things that I don't have any <laughs> explanations for. I do this all the time, but there was something in my spirit because what had happened is that right after I became a believer, I got involved with the, with the Rock Church in Virginia Beach. And of course, I began to be grounded and rooted in the Word. And the more that I read the Word, this, this, this thing about Jewishness keeps jumping out of mm -hmm. this Gentile Bible that I have, you know? And I, I can't escape it, even to the fact that uh, even this Jesus guy, he's Jewish, you know? I don't know Jesus from nothing. And so uh, uh, I asked my mom when she called me, I said, Mom, is there any Jewish blood in our family? And, and the phone, totally dead silence. And that's unusual for my mom. She always, like a Yiddish lady, she always has something to say. And uh, so she was very quiet. And I said, what's wrong, Mom? She said, why do you ask that question, son? And, and, and I said, well, Mom, I just want to know, is there anyone in our family has ever been Jewish or whatever? She says, I am, son. 
And uh, my well, mother. Well, if she's Jewish, that makes well, you Jewish. Well, that's the way that the that the rabbinic law reads. Right. You know, I have the right to Aliyah to return to the nation of Israel, and so it. it it, it destroyed my whole concept of what Christianity was in the sense that, you know, you think of Christianity, you think of the Gentile aspect of it, you, you, you never sense the Jewishness. And that's what I was sensing in the scripture was the Jewishness. Now, I'm, and, 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 and I had felt the Spirit speak to me, oh, probably five or maybe eight or ten months before this, I said, Lord, I said, I wish I had been born the seed of Abraham. He said, but you are of the seed of Abraham. I said, yeah, I know. I said, the Bible says I'm an adopted seed and whatever. He says, no, you're the seed of Abraham. And, I, and you know, thinking back, and that's why I asked my mom that, was because of what had been, in, been put in my spirit some months before I ever asked my mother about that. Now, you have uh, a, a saying, if you will, and it goes something like this. When the foundation is right, the glory comes down. When the pattern is right. When the pattern is right. right. When the pattern is right, the glory comes. And this is what I began to discover in God's Word because no one was teaching it. I had to, you know, it was like I was on a, uh, 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 going through the Bible by tr totally being led by the Holy Spirit. And I began to see things there that there was a pattern to all things. And even in the secular world, in the humanistic world, there's a pattern to all things. I don't care what it is, there's a pattern to everything. And so there's a pattern to life. We're finding this out with the DNA and whatever now that we're right. finding. I mean, I mean, there's a pattern to everything, and, and, and things are duplicated by pattern. And so I began to study the life of Moses, and Nabi Moshe, the prophet Moses. And what I began to discover was that, 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 that Jesus made the statement. Yeshua makes the statement. He says, if you don't believe the writings of Moses, you'll never believe what I have to say. Now, he says that in, in, the, in the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, under Yochanan the John, uh, John's writing. And, and, and well, wait a minute, what did, what did Moses write about this guy, Yeshua? Or Jesus. And so I began to look at the life of Moses. The only thing Moses wrote about was the fact he wrote about the tabernacle, the priesthood, its furnishings, the sacrificial system, the, the feast days. Which cetera, most whatever. people find pretty boring that call themselves Christians today. Well, so are the begats when you open up the New, New right. Testament. The begats are very boring, but they aren't boring when you understand that the begats are there to prove the genealogy of Jesus. That's why the begats are there. And so, and so everything has a purpose. There's nothing boring. I, I found out a long time, there's nothing boring in God's Word. If you find something boring in God's Word, it's boring because you don't understand what it's trying to convey. So there, that's where boredom comes, comes from. And so uh, as I began to read this life of Moses and all that the whole nation of Israel did, <clears throat> Then I stumbled across the scripture in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where, it, where Paul deals with ignorance. He said, Brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. And then he goes through all the things that happened to the nation of Israel in the 40-year wilderness experience. And he says, he concludes it in verse 11, he said, For is, all of this has happened as examples to us for our admonition upon whom, or instruction upon whom the ends of the world have come. The church is going to come back. This is not a prophetic word. I'm not a, a prophet in this sense. I'm just reading the word. We're going to have to come back to the Jewish roots that God had given to the patterning for his whole scripture. Well, when you, the pattern's right, the glory will fall. Well, you know what <clears> I find <throat> fascinating is that when Dick Rubin began teaching this in a sleepy little southern town, Pensacola, Florida, at a church called Brownsville, the pastor of that church says that when he gave this foundational teaching of the pattern, <clears throat> the Jewish pattern, and when the church got the pattern right, one of the greatest outpourings of the Spirit of the living God occurred in this church in modern day history. We'll find out about it when we come back. Be right back after this. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. I'm having so much fun with Dick Rubin, but let's find out from Janie in the control room who our guest is next week. Janie? Sid will be speaking to a man by the name of Chris Vallotton, and he had a nervous breakdown at the age of 22, and he would shake all day at night. He would be sweating all night, and he was just so filled with fear. He actually saw demons, I mean, demons would rearrange things in his house but then he was supernaturally set free and he didn't have mental illness. He, he wasn't mentally ill anymore. And he, this man, he went from being so fearful and now he's fearless. I mean, he's had crazy people trying to kill him and he has no fear. Well, that's my kind of man, no fear. How would you like to have no fear? Tune in next week. 
Dick Rubin, when you give this teaching on the, the, the pattern from the Jewish scriptures, and you gave it at a church called Brownsville in Pensacola, Florida, uh, in 1993, 93, March, 93, March of but, and you prophesied there would be a great move of God there before it happened, and in 95, Father's Day, there was a tremendous explosion of God's Spirit, and what has history shown on this church? Well, as far as the history of the revival, the history of the revival, of course, it began June 18th, 1995. It's continuing to this day. Uh, uh, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think, in my opinion, that it's really revival as to what we're about ready to see. It's been a wonderful outpouring. It's probably been one of the most, uh, uh, at least one of the greatest manifestations of God in America. Uh, probably even surpassing because we have the uh, media exposure now, probably even surpassing things that were done by Whitfield and uh, Wesley and these kind of things. But Oh, you intrigued me. You said it's nothing compared to what's about ready to happen. And let me tell you what was going on there and is going on there. It is spectacular. I mean, millions of people have been in this tiny little church and had their lives transformed uh, and, and Miracles are taking place, and and Dick Rubin, you just said it is nothing compared to what's going to happen. What is and going to happen? I believe that there's going to be four levels to this revival, and I was with a, a brother here or, or someone that's a friend of mine, Jerry Seville, not long ago, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and the Lord revealed to me there'd be four levels of this revival, and uh, he led me to uh, um, uh, Ezekiel 47, where it says that there was water coming from the throne as to the ankles and then to the knees and to the loins and water so deep you have to swim. swim. And uh, the Lord began to show me the stages of this revival. It began with Rodney Howard Brown. He brought a trickle of anointing to a dry and, and, mm -hmm. and, and dead land. And then it moved to Toronto, and there it became more of a flow of the stream of the anointing. Then it moved to uh, Brownsville. There it became the river of God. But there's something that Habakkuk said. It says, the glory of God and the knowledge of the glory of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's going to be a flood stage of revival. And the four points of, the, uh, of what uh, Ezekiel said to the... To, to the ankles, to the knees, to the loins, and then water so deep that you have to swim. We're about ready to have this next wave of revival. There's a great preparation going on now, and I believe that multiple millions of people will be swept into the kingdom just before the Messiah sounds the great shofar. Now, you've seen something recently that's really a foretaste of this in Norway. What did you see? Well, the Lord took me out of a car. And, uh, it was uh, in September of uh, 1983. And I was going out of my car, literally out of my mm -hmm. car, for probably 20 to 25 minutes. And one of the things that, uh, that was shown to me is I believe now, I didn't understand it then, but I believe it now to be a last day's move of God, where multiple people were coming out of wheelchairs, they were being healed, they were being set free, they were being uh, uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, they were receiving salvation, and no man was laying hands on them. Now, I saw that in September of 1983. And then I was just in Norway. Uh, we just came back from Norway a few weeks ago. And the Lord said one night, just worship me. And we began to worship, the, just, just enter into a deep realm of worship. And the Lord said, now have the people that are sick in their body come forward. And we did. And I said, and, and he said, have them stand there and do nothing but worship me. And uh, don't lay hands on them. Don't pray for them. Don't do anything. Just have them worship me. And as they were beginning to worship, people with, he, with uh, infirmities, I mean, talking about uh, twisted legs and whatever, ankles and whatever, have, had infirmities to 18, 20, 22, 24 years, instantly healed. Then we had them, as they were being healed in that worship, they would come up to the platform and begin to testify what had happened to them in that worship. And I believe, Sid, that here again, we go back to the patterns. The last piece of furniture that Moses wrote about in the holy place, which I believe is related to the church, is the altar of incense. And the last great move of God will have also involved in that this great worship. Because we've got to come back into this love affair with Jesus, and worship is our love affair with Jesus. And then the manifestation of the anointing comes and the healings come. And, I, and like I say, we just experienced this in Norway. I've never experienced anything like it in my life. Speaking of healings, You've prayed for people that are deaf. Tell me about that. There was a young man who, was, uh, who had come to revival one night uh, at Brownsville, and you were there many times. And so because we were in the leadership, we had to escape, so to speak, out the back before you were mobbed by everyone. And this young man caught me just before I got to my car. And he couldn't speak very well, and he had a speech impediment. And, and he said uh, uh, to the effect that Brother Reuben, the Lord said that I would come to Brownsville. I'd be healed. I've got to go. There's my bus over there. And I mean, he said this, and I'm trying to understand what he's saying, trying to get in my car mm -hmm. and whatever. And uh, he said, I'm deaf. Uh, I, I can't hear. I'm, I'm deaf. 
and he had been taught how to speak by, read lip, uh, uh, by uh, uh, reading lips mm -hmm. and how to speak. But he had very slurred speech. I, and I haven't had any great faith. I'm tired. I've been there. Till, I think this is 1 o'clock in the morning. I come out, and I simply said, Spirit of death. I stuck my finger in his ear and said, Spirit of death, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, come out of this man now. Well, you know how I do now. Okay, that right. scares hell itself. So, <laughs> so You're pretty loud. Yeah, pretty, I know. <laughs> pretty loud. And I, I snapped my fingers a couple times on either side of him, and I noticed he had his head down, and he began to cry. And he's just a young man. Maybe he's, uh, maybe if I have to guess, maybe 17, 16, 17, maybe 18 years old. And I said, what's the matter, son? Can you hear? He said, yeah, I hear my voice. I hear. And he cried. And two weeks later, his aunt calls to give the report. Now, I don't know where he's from. I don't know this day. What it, my wife took the report. And they were putting him into speech therapy then. And the first thing he said to his mother when he got off the bus, he says, Mom, I can hear. He said, my voice always sounded like this. And so, you know, I don't have great faith. I didn't have great faith that night. You know, we pray and we pray believing. I, it would, to me, it was just a normal prayer, but something supernatural happened to that young man. I don't understand it to this day. I've tried to go back and think, Lord, what did I do? What did I say? What, you know, was there anything special I did? But, uh, and, and I had a man one night also there in Brownsville. He, came, he comes up with a long cane with a red tip or, you know, mm -hmm. white cane with a red tip Blind. on it. And all of a sudden, you know, this panic thing, oh, God, they brought the blind to me. It's gone. I'm going to pray for him. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> I pray for this guy. He's thrown down to the carpet. Well, you know, you were in Brownsville. You know, that's kind of a normal thing. So I walked around the back portion of where the sanctuary was, walked down the other aisle, and I just happened to look over, and there's this man sitting on the floor, and he's looking all around. I said, wait a minute, what's a blind man doing looking around? So I sent Scott Brown, who works for us, and then he was, uh, he was one of my people that, that, that walked with me on the floor. He walked around, and, and he found out the man's eyes came over open instantly like that. I didn't have great faith. I try to remember, what did I say? How did I do? Lord, you know, I can't figure it out. It was I, just I a have supernatural have something. Thing. I have something even more important than that to ask you. When you were an enforcer in an a outlaw motorcycle gang, you made the statement that you hated blacks, Puerto Ricans, I guess any minority. What about now? What, what do you think when you see a black man or a Puerto I Rican? See, I don't see a black man. I see a soul that's precious to God, and it's a compassion that has happened to me in revival. I don't know what happened. I don't know when it happened, but I was in that environment for so long that my compassion is for there, the there's lost. There's tears in your eyes right now. Yeah. Why? Because I love people. The greatest miracle, everybody's running after these signs and wonders and miracles. When I tell the people, I say the greatest sign and wonder and miracle is to see a sinner on his way to hell, get on his knees, pray a prayer. Now he's a saint on his way to heaven. If that's not the greatest miracle, you can die and, 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 and go to hell following prophecies and, 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 and signs and wonders, but you never go to heaven without knowing Jesus. Did you hear that? Matters. You will never go to heaven unless you know Jesus. Not you know religion, not you know church, but you know Jesus for yourself. Think for yourself. Experience Him for yourself. It's your life. There is a destiny and a purpose for your life. What are you going to do about it right now? Ron, are you going to know there's no other name given unto men in which we must be saved but the name of Jesus? This is a supernatural. He just prophesied, Dick, that this is divine appointment. Repeat this prayer. Urge it right now, out loud. Dear God, say it with me now. Dear God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. With your help, I turn from my sins. I believe that Jesus died in my place, and by his blood, I am forgiven. And now that I'm forgiven, I make Jesus my Messiah and Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, come inside of me. And, and, and Dick, if you will begin to praise God, and I'm going to begin to worship Him, people are going to be healed right now. Praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Almighty God. We praise the holy name of Jesus. Bless the name of Jesus, O God. We worship you. We worship you, O God. You alone are worthy. You alone are Lord. You alone are King. We praise you. We praise you, O Jewish Messiah, King of the Jews. Yeshua HaMashiach Sikeno, Jesus the Messiah, our You're righteousness. The You're the bless you, O oh God. We bless you. You're getting all the praise. You're getting all the yes. glory from what's going to happen right now.